What's up y'all, Shuffle, and in today's video we're going to do a new player guide for Darkest Dungeon 2. In this video I'll talk about the gameplay loop, I'll explain a lot of the basic mechanics such as combat, traveling, the inn, picking teams, everything in between on all of that stuff, and I'll do my best to throw in tips wherever I can. I apologize in advance if the video is a bit long or some of the explanations are too fast, because sometimes an explanation honestly doesn't need more than a simple sentence. So if there's something you want to hear again, feel free to rewind, and I'm not trying to sound like a jerk when I say that. Starting off, what is Darkest Dungeon 2? It is a roguelike as well as a turn-based battler. The game does have an overall story that's told to you in bits and pieces. Sometimes there are cutscenes, and other times it's through little dialogue or node explanations. And the game requires you to beat it a few times in order to see everything. The core gameplay loop is that you start the game, you pick a confession, which is the act or the storyline that you're going to follow, and then you pick a team and then you get rolling. Once you've picked a team, you go through the valley, which is a tutorial area. Then you go through three areas of your choosing, with the potential bonus area of the sluice that we'll talk about later, and then you go to the mountain. Once you are at the mountain, you will fight a final boss and get that bit of the story. Win or lose, once you get through the mountain or have to start over, you'll go back through the same beginning again, except this time you get to spend your meta progression currency, which are called Candles of Hope. You use these candles to purchase various upgrades and unlock heroes, and it's its own very in-depth topic on what to get first and what you should be focusing on. So if you want more information on that, check out the Altar of Hope guide that I will have linked under this video. One thing I will say too is that starting out is much harder than when you have everything unlocked. So if you feel like the game is difficult, that is just the roguelike nature of it. The more you play, the more you unlock, the more tools you have, and the easier it gets, especially because now you have knowledge on how the enemies work. Now that we know how the game starts, let's find out how the game progresses. So as you see from the moment you start the game, you are driving a stagecoach pulled by two horses. This is how you travel from one location to another. The wagon controls are relatively simple. You can hold W or double tap W in order to auto drive forward. And there is an option in the menu under controls that I recommend maxing out for the wagon because it makes it more easier to turn with. Every time you leave the inn and you begin your journey in the next region, there will be a little intro section and the game will scout every location, or at least it will attempt to. You're not guaranteed to scout every single thing on the map, and that's part of the experience. You're supposed to take what you know and go with what you don't know and try and make the best choices possible. The map can have a lot of visual noise, but the things you're looking at are the roads, which have their own events, which is why they're a bit smaller, and then there are nodes, which is where you stop the wagon and have to make choices. Picking a relatively safe route in terms of roads and rewarding nodes on your way to the next inn is key for success. The stagecoach has two forms of durability, one of them are wheel tokens and the other are armor tokens. These are pretty straightforward, as you're moving you might run over a rough patch of road that breaks one of your wheel tokens or you get hit by a trap which breaks an armor token. If these tokens are maxed out you will have bonuses when you start combat or you will heal more while traveling. If you run out of tokens you're not in danger the second it happens but if you run over another hazard that attacks your tokens that are no longer there such as your wheel tokens you will have to fight a group of bandits. Normally bandits aren't too threatening but the repair fights are a a little harder than regular fights, so you definitely shouldn't underestimate them. Worth noting as well is even if you are out of wheel tokens or they're not maxed out, you will still heal while driving. Because of this fact, being able to heal to full before battle ends isn't as important as it was in the first game if you played it. As you travel, your characters will talk to one another. We call these barks because they're just little speech bubbles that pop up, and sometimes it's just random banter. Other times, they build or destroy relationships between each other. We'll talk about relationships later. The final thing to consider on the wagon that also applies to battles is the torch. This is the symbol of hope for the journey. It has a meter of 0 to 100. The torch will be full every time you leave an inn, but it can get lowered while you drive just normally, 
as well as through events at nodes. It is very important to keep the flame as high as possible. The reason being that the higher it is, the more benefits you get and the more penalties the enemies have. If the torch gets very low, you have actual penalties to yourself and the enemies get buffs. If the torch ends up reaching zero, you have to fight a cultist ambush. You do not get any rewards from this encounter, and it is strictly meant to be punishing. If you are able to succeed, you'll get a bit more torch to hopefully make it to either the end of the area or to a node that will give you more. While you are parked at each inn, you are able to equip your stagecoach with gear. This is called stagecoach gear. It has up to four slots that you have to unlock. It has a torch slot, which is for infernal currently. The other two slots are trophies, which are from bosses that you defeat. And there is one more slot for your pets. You have to unlock pets at the altar, but they provide various effects. All of the mechanics that I just talked about in terms of driving will apply to every single region that you travel through in the game, which is why I covered them first. Before you leave an inn, you are prompted to pick a region. Usually it's a choice between one or two, sometimes it can be three, or in the case of the mountain, once you get to the end of the game, it's just the mountain. What changes in each region are the enemies, the loot that you can get, the mechanics of the enemies, as well as the lair boss. So there's a lot of choices to consider depending on what team you have. One exception worth talking about is the sluice. The sluice is a free region essentially that shows up randomly and it's a very short one where you fight a specific group of monsters and there are some various items that you can pick up. The reason the sluice is worth talking about too is the fact that since it is a free region, it's a chance to take on a little bit more challenge in order to get more rewards. This is a nice power spike for pretty much any team in the game. One other hidden benefit of the sluice is that it serves as a region reset. So if you get two regions you don't like or you don't want to do, you can go through the sluice and it will re-roll them at the next end. One thing to note as well is the sluice is entirely unscouted. You cannot scout it, you can't see anything that's coming up, so it's pretty much random and you just have to do your best. Outside of the sluice, let's quickly talk about the nodes and the roads that you will encounter while traveling through the other four regions in the game. The first one, assistance encounters. These will benefit you in some way. Usually you can also gain torch. Sometimes you can lose it, but if you do lose torch, you get a lot of other benefits as well. Resistance encounters. At these ones, you will have a choice to fight enemies. Usually it's mandatory, sometimes it's not. And if you are successful in vanquishing these foes, you will reduce loathing, which is what we'll talk about in a bit, and you get items and mastery points. The Oasis is a stress recovery node. You can have someone basically take a bath on the Oasis and heal some stress, or or you can get some spring water from the oasis which is a very nice combat item to have on very rare occasions you can do both academic studies are probably the biggest wild cards while traveling because the effects are relatively unknown they have various outcomes depending on which one you see but these outcomes can range from pretty awesome and almost run winning sometimes to horrible and it can almost ruin a character even the most dangerous and risky ones, however, usually give good rewards. And there's something to be said about the actual fun that happens in the sheer chaos of these nodes, so they are one of my favorites. One of the easiest nodes to understand, and probably the one most people will gravitate towards, is the Academics Cache. There's no trick to this one, there are no choices to make, you show up, you get a box full of items. Creature Dens are an interesting node because you have to fight two waves of tough enemies, but if you are successful, you get a deliverable item, which means if you can reach the inn with this item, you get various benefits, usually mastery alongside some other things. It will tell you what it does when you mouse over it. Another straightforward node is the Watchtower. This scouts the rest of the map, so anything beyond the Watchtower will be revealed to you. It doesn't matter how far away it is, doesn't matter what path it's on, you will be able to see every road and node and encounter before you get to the next end. The next node we'll talk about is the Hoarder. He's pretty difficult to time on your journey because you need a good amount of wealth to really make use of him, but if you're able to show up and find one while you have a bunch of gold and baubles, you can really boost up your party's effectiveness because he sells a lot of good stuff. He's also the best source of trinkets outside of bosses. Hospitals are one of everyone's favorite, I imagine. Hospitals aren't any combat encounters or anything. You simply just show up and you can heal your party. You 
you can heal their HP, you can buy helpful restorative items, you can buy preventative items, you can remove bad quirks by clicking on it and then clicking remove. You can lock in one positive quirk at 32 gold. This is really useful for memoried heroes, which we're not really gonna talk about in this video. So don't feel pressured to do that. And then finally, my favorite feature of the hospital is removing diseases. Diseases are very rare, but usually incredibly damaging. So having some kind of source of consistent disease removal is welcome. Hero Shrines are nodes that let you continue a hero's personal story, so you can either hear some narration or do a story battle, and if you have not unlocked all of their moves, you will unlock the next one that they are supposed to get. If a hero has completed all of their shrine backstory encounters, when you reach these hero shrines, instead when you select that unit, you are given one mastery point. A location that is always scouted in every region that you go to is the lair. The lair is the home of the region boss. This is always the same boss depending on what region you go to, and beating one gives you a ton of rewards as well as a trophy. Unless it's the tutorial version of Denial, which is the first confession, you will need to beat a lair at some point and put a trophy on the wagon in order to get to the mountain. Currently, the lair bosses do not scale in terms of difficulty, so if you want to have the easiest time beating one and the best chance, save it for region 3. This way your team's at its strongest and you have the best chance. The last two nodes to talk about are cultist nodes. There are two versions of this. There's the regular cultist node, which appears mid-region, and usually you fight some kind of combination of evangelists, cherubs, and I think heralds and altars, potentially. And they're definitely threatening, but they are the only source in the game of cultist trinkets. Cultist trinkets are trinkets that make a set. You need a dark impulse, which is the black flame, in order to use the other cultist trinket, which is usually something that can be very powerful, but also has a substantial downside. A lot of them can be really fun, and if you're able to maximize their potential, you can see some really strong characters come out of it. The other type of cultist node is the Oblivion's Rampart. You can consider this the gatekeeper before the next inn. The Oblivion's Rampart has a specific fight depending on what part of the game you're in, and in general, it is harder than the regular cultist fight, so definitely be prepared for it. If you can get past the Oblivion's Rampart, congratulations, you made it to the next inn, which is essentially a checkpoint. Once you're at the inn, you're able to heal up your units, give them items to give them buffs, bolster their affinity, aka relationships, put on new wagon gear, and then venture off again. Something else of note for the inns is not only is it a great place to buy items, you also spend your mastery points here to make your skills stronger, and this is the most common source of quirks. A lot of the inns have their own special modifier, and you can see this by mousing over the sign once you're there. Quirks are little passives that your characters have. Some are good, some are bad. You can tell by if they're either yellow or blue. And normally when you reach an inn, every character rolls at least once to get a new quirk. In between all the nodes that you go to, you're going to have to deal with some type of road encounter. Very rarely the road is just empty and there's nothing you have to worry about on that, which is pretty nice. But when you come to crossroads, your team will usually have an opinion on which way to go. If you ignore what someone wants to do, they take one stress. Stress is pretty bad. We'll talk about it later, but by and large, normally you don't have to worry too much about road choice stress. If the road is not empty, it will have one of four other things on it. It will have either a fight, which is denoted as a red diamond with cross swords. It will have loathing, which is a stacking debuff against you that gives enemies various benefits, as well as it makes your flame drain faster. And as mentioned earlier, loathing can be lowered by taking fights at nodes. The other two things that can appear on the roads are hazards and rough patches. These will break your armor and wheel tokens respectively. At nodes, it's important to pay attention to your choices because some characters will agree and some characters will disagree. If they agree, it shows a gold shimmer around the ones that agree. If they disagree, it shows a blue shimmer. If your team agrees or disagrees, it will affect their affinity. We call these affinity pips because they're just little diamonds. The whole track adds up to 20. And the easiest rule of thumb regarding affinity is to keep the torch high and keep the number over 9. The reason 9 matters is because 9 is the break point before things start to go against you if it gets lower than that. So 8 and below, you have a much higher chance of getting negative relationships. 9 to, I believe,
believe 12 is pretty much neutral unless something else affects it. And then 13 plus is when you can start getting good relationships. A lot of things govern affinity, pip, gain, and loss. Your road choices, sometimes your characters talking to each other on the road, and tons of in items affect this as well. You can always mouse over a pair's relationship to see their chance of getting a positive or negative. The results of your relationships are revealed to you when you leave the inn before you start traveling in the next region. The whole side of the screen can have between zero and six outcomes and clicking on each one reveals that outcome. Once you've made it through three regions, you will have the chance to tackle the mountain and I'm not going to spoil what the mountain is, but it does have the final boss of the confession. Next up, we'll talk about the basics of combat. There's a lot of depth to the combat and it could be its own different video. So we're just gonna cover the basics in this one. The first thing to consider with your team are their positions. We call these ranks. So from right to left on the player side, it's one, two, three, and four. And it mirrors that for the enemy. So from left to right for them, it's one, two, three, four. Some enemies can take up multiple spaces. You can change your team's ranks by dragging their portraits around while you're driving. The reason ranks are important is because certain abilities can only be fired from certain ranks and their targeting is dependent on the enemy's rank as well. You also may have noticed that your team has two different types of health bars. They have the red one, which is HP. I think we're all pretty familiar with HP and how it works. And then the other one is stress. Stress is on a scale from zero to 10, and the higher it gets, the more dangerous it is for your characters. The easiest way to think about these is health is more of a temporary damage and stress is more of a permanent damage. It is much harder to get rid of stress than it is to heal HP. One of the main mechanics that Darkest Dungeon is known for is Death's Door. If your character hits zero HP, they do not outright die. The game is balanced around this. They enter a state called Death's Door, and the next hit or instance of damage they take has a chance of killing them. This is shown by their death blow resist. If you are able to heal them off of Death's Door, even if it's one HP, then they can get hit again for even a thousand damage, it doesn't matter, they'll go straight back to Death Door from that point. One of the biggest changes between Darkest Dungeon 1 and Darkest Dungeon 2 is that now some enemies have Death Blow Resist. This was not the case in the first game. Death Blow Resist is mostly reserved for tougher enemies or bosses, although some regular enemies have it as well. And it works just the same as it does for heroes. If you hit them and they go to zero HP, they don't die, they hit Death's Door, and then you have to make the exact same check to try and kill them that the enemies make against you. Stress isn't really a factor until it gets around the halfway point. I believe it's four and higher. And that is when your characters start to become way more irritable than normal. They will yell at each other if they don't get heals or buffs. The game will show you this is gonna happen, thankfully. And if they end up hitting 10 stress, they get what is called a resolve check. If they fail the check, they get what is called a meltdown, which is where their stress drops down, as well as their HP, and they usually get a negative quirk. This is dangerous because it'll take most characters from full HP to a state where the next hit will take them to death's door, and then they're in serious trouble. Meltdowns also severely impact relationships, so you want to avoid these as much as possible. However, all hope is not lost if you are making a resolve check. Sometimes the character can rally itself and get what is called resolute, where it's pretty much the opposite of everything a meltdown does. You get positive relationship gains, you heal your stress, and you heal your HP, as well as most likely getting a positive quirk. The chance before any modifiers for a meltdown is 80% and resolute is 20 respectively. These can be modified through quirks and trinkets. There are three types of damage over time in the game. They are called bleed, blight, and burn. I don't know if the fact that they're all named with the letter B is intentional, but that is what they are. And there are no secondary effects to them. They just check three different resistances and they do damage over time. So when you mouse over the icon, it'll show you the damage you're taking for the amount of turns that you're taking it. And this damage is applied at the start of that character's turn, which means one of the most dangerous situations in the game is you get hit to death door with the character and they have a damage over time effect on top of them because that just gives them an immediate check to see if they die or not. So having multiple heroes that can help either heal or use items on each other before this instance occurs is beneficial. 
There is one inverse to damage over time, which is called regeneration. That is shown as a green plus, and it shows how much you're healing per turn. As long as the amount of regeneration you have is higher than the amount of damage over time you're taking, you will actually not die to damage over time at the start of your turn. Instead, you will be healed. However, this is very hard to do consistently as sources of damage over time are plentiful and sources of regeneration are not. Tokens are the main focal point of combat. They appear under the heroes and the players alike. To follow with the game's coloring theme, the yellow ones are the good ones and the blue ones are the bad ones. There are a couple other varieties of colors for tokens as well as numerous special ones that exist, but that is too much to talk about at one time. Thankfully, you can just mouse over them when they appear and it tells you what it does, or you can hold the H key in order to see what they do. The main ones we're talking about though, which are the most common ones that will usually appear in some capacity for heroes and monsters, are dodge, which gives you a chance to dodge getting hit, block, which reduces the amount of damage you take when you get hit, crit, which guarantees a critical hit on your next attack, strength, which increases the damage of the next attack by 50%, and they have inverses. Those inverses being vulnerable, which increases damage that target takes by 50%, blind, which gives you a 50% chance to miss, and Weaken, which reduces your damage by 50%. Of note, Strength, Vuln, and Weaken do not affect the amount of damage that damage over time deals, just the on-hit contact damage. Many, 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 many moves and effects and items in the game generate or remove tokens, so it's very important to check your moves and your items to see what they're doing. Other things to note about tokens is they're considered as a charge, meaning that if you have one blind token and you attack, only one attack has minus 50% chance to hit. It's not every attack that you make until the end of time, it's just that one. Tokens also stack up to three most of the time. There are a couple of exceptions, but you can tell how high they're stacking by looking at the token itself and seeing if there are zero, one, or two pips under it. The final helpful tip about tokens outside of the special ones is that most of the normal ones only last for three rounds. That means once the character has taken three actions, if the token has not been triggered in some way, it will decay on its own. The exceptions to the three token stack rule, as well as the three turn limit rule, are daze, speed, and stun. These will trigger immediately on the character's turn. And one final tip about tokens is that they do cancel each other out. Days cancels speed and vice versa. Strength cancels weaken, vice versa. Block cancels vulnerable and vice versa. And blind and dodge don't necessarily cancel crit or each other, but they are the biggest mitigating factors against each other. I'm sorry if that was a lot to take in. Tokens are a huge deal. They pop up all the time and they are necessary to understanding how the game works and succeeding in combat. Now let's talk about some straightforward stuff. So as you progress in the regions, the later regions two and three, there's an increasing chance for enemies to get what is called ordainment. Ordainment is denoted as an iron crown that appears above the enemy's health bar. And essentially, it's just a stronger version of that enemy. Most of the power-ups are the same, depending on the confession. Usually, it's an increase in speed, HP, damage, and dot chance, as well as dot damage. And then there are effects of ordainment that change depending on what the confession is. This is influenced by the final boss. If you're ever curious to see what the ordainment effects are, as well as what the enemy is capable of doing, then you need to use what is called the academic view. This is triggered in two ways. One is mousing over the enemy and holding left alt. This will zoom in on the enemy. If you've seen the attack before, it'll show up with the details. If you've not seen it, it will be a question mark. This is so the game doesn't tell you what the enemy can do before you've experienced it. And the other way to trigger the academics view is to click the middle mouse button, AKA your scroll wheel, just click it in and it will pop up. Your heroes do not get specialized equipment like swords and armor, but they do get access to trinkets. Trinkets are little just 
items that have significance either to the world or to the characters themselves. There are generic trinkets, which anyone can equip at any time. And then there are hero specific ones that you unlock by filling up the hero's track on the Altar of Hope. Trinkets have various levels of power. They begin either at something that's pretty small and inconsequential, but it's better than nothing, to pretty much game changing and character altering effects on the strongest ones. You can only have two on one person at a time, and it is important to always be on the lookout for new trinkets and cycling them out if you find better ones to make your characters stronger and enable their strategies. Combat items are essentially an extra equipable skill, if you will, that your characters can have, but they have limited amounts, and combat items can do really cool and crazy things. They can do little things like healing your teammates, either their HP or their stress, they can stun enemies, blind enemies, move enemies. They can do all kinds of crazy stuff. So make sure you're checking what they can do and seeing how they impact your strategy. The main benefit of combat items as well is you can get some really cool interactions with tokens, depending on the character. And it's a way to give characters abilities that they normally don't have. For instance, Highwayman is a character you start with. He's really good at dealing damage. He can't heal himself or other teammates. If you find a healing combat item, guess what? Now he can heal other people, at least until they run out. Important to note as well, combat items are free actions. They will not use your turn to use one. So definitely throw them out when you feel the need to. And so ends the basic combat tutorial. A couple extra tips I can give you out of the ones that I threw in while I was talking about everything are in regards to pacing and target selection. So when I say pacing or tempo, the general rule of thumb that I at least subscribe to is if it's not a boss battle, the fight should be decided in about four turns. Not all the enemies had to be dead in four turns, but ideally you have pretty much the fight in hand by turn four. And whatever's left alive is either about to die or it's pretty unthreatening to you. So it's not gonna do anything that ends the run if it throws out a random crit, for instance. The easiest way to achieve this, I feel, is to focus fire certain targets. So this comes with a bit of experience, but normally you wanna focus fire either a dangerous enemy or a squishy enemy. It doesn't matter if a really tanky, dangerous enemy is still alive, if you remove all of the support enemies that are alongside it, for instance. It is very important to always keep in mind the concept of action economy in turn-based games. The easiest and most consistent way to win, by and large, in any turn-based game is to give yourself a turn advantage against the enemy's turn disadvantage. If you're able to turn the fight into a 3v4, on turn one, you're in a better shape than if it's a 4v4 and you get hit in the face four times. And that's it for the video. Thanks so much for watching. Let me know what you think down below in the comments if there's anything I missed, anything you found helpful, or anything that can be improved upon in terms of the video. If you're interested in seeing more from me, there are plenty of videos. I have lots of playlists. I link pretty much anything relevant under the video in the description box, like Discord, Twitter, Twitch, Patreon. If you wanna catch other content, talk to me, talk to some other people, ask questions, all of that fantastic and awesome stuff. As always though, thanks so much for watching and I'll see you next time.